Hi, Bahamas. Just give me one second here. I want to talk about uh, the rules of the House of Assembly and, one, and, and the reason why we are not getting any type of uh, substantive messaging coming out of the House of Assembly. Uh, because essentially, we don't demand uh, much uh, from our particular leadership. And a lot of people may ask now exactly what rules I am thinking of. Uh, a lot of time we sit and we watch the, the House of Assembly and we, we see uh, for hours and hours and hours and hours uh, individuals who would actually come and read scripts. And I say read, I mean literally they spend hours just reading 10 of them, 20 of them, 30 of them. And this is why most people tune out from the House of Assembly because essentially you're not getting anything that really de de that deals with the issue. What you have is written speeches for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, two hours sometime, that basically just repeats the same thing that supports the party position written by someone else. Individuals can't even follow the trend of what is being uh, what is being said in the house. So why is it important? Uh, first, let me just tell you all who's tuning in, <clears throat> the rules of the house. In the House of Assembly prohibits reading speeches from the floor of the House of Assembly. They expect you to speak uh, exp exponentially, to be knowledgeable about the subject for which you speak, uh, to understand uh, what it is that you speak on and be able to defend, uh, be able to debate, be able to defend your position, be able to understand the position of the other person. You know, it said is that if you can't argue for something, you should not be arguing against it. If you can't argue both sides of the equation, you shouldn't argue for or against. So what happens is we have individuals that go into the House of Assembly and read. But here's the rule says. The rules of the House says no one should read a speech in the House of Assembly. So everything that you see what is happening in the House of Assembly right now violates the rules of the House. And so essentially what we need is that we need individuals that understands governance. So you have people who take positions of ministers and parliamentary secretaries and, and, and positions of of, uh, uh, of, this, of our government agencies. I just, just want you to imagine that somebody is running your business and they don't know enough on your business to speak for 30 minutes without reading uh, 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 some speech that's prepared for them. It shows you the competence of that individual. Uh, the whole concept is something called commutative competence and it shows knowledge of, knowledge of position, everything else that we should expect from our leaders. And so what we have is leaders that basically have no comprehension of what they are in the House of Assembly for. And so what I'm saying to us is that we must ask uh, three major individuals that have the ability to bring this up because the government is not going to do it. Um, one is the uh, member for uh, Senator Will Reese Chipman. I'm, gonna sp I I'm calling on you, Reese Chipman. I'm calling on you, the member for uh, Golden Isles. Uh, uh, is it Golden Isles? Anyway, it was Juan Miller. I'm calling on you, Juan Miller, Reese Chipman, and I'm calling on the member for South Andres, uh, Price Will Forbes, to, to ask in the next sitting of the House that the rules of the house be followed. No more reading of speeches. Either you're competent to speak on the subject for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or one hour, or sit down and shut up. Speak when you have something to say, not just to say something. So please, I want all of you that now understand this to call your member of parliament and tell them that you want the rules of the house to, to, to be to be adhered to. Because what we need is we need people to speak to the issues. Can you imagine you sit and you and you listen to Parliament for three days and four days like I do, and you hear nothing on the issues that's facing our nation, nothing on the economy, nothing on their community. Just I like to thank uh, our constituency and then praising the Prime Minister for choosing you to run in that constituency, praising the Prime Minister for choosing you and having come every single week. 
It's like you have to heap honors and praise upon the prime minister because he gave you a title. And so all we have to do is to go back to asking our leaders to follow the rules of the house. Speak when you have something to say and not just to say something. Then we can demand of them that we ask, we'll ask. we have more time for them to address the issues such as the economy. We have a, we have a Dorian, post-Dorian issue. We have a current COVID issue and we're facing a post-COVID crisis in our economy. And not one time in the last three to four months has anybody spoke to the current condition beyond the lockdowns. I'm talking about what do we do now? How do we prepare ourselves for the new normal? What is it that's gonna happen in our schools? Don't mind what Jeff Lloyd is saying, it's not real. Because what we have is our media, I mean, I, I, I am embarrassed for our media, but you know, I, I use an expression though. Our media is like people who sit in church and the pastor says something, right? And they know he's saying it wrong, but they don't have the courage to say anything because they think everybody in the church believes it. Or for the mere fact that it's like a blind man describing something else to a blind man, and so they dare not say anything, they're not blind or a nation of, uh, of emperors who all naked, and one emperor will not tell the other emperor that they're naked because they, they must also admit they're naked. In essence, the media knows nothing about the now or tomorrow. So they dare not ask the question. They ask these little girly questions. This is why, why else do you think that the, the, the prime minister could emasculate them? Two questions. You know, if I don't answer your questions, you got two questions, and the media sit there. Why the media just refuse to show up? and let the Prime Minister talk to whatever. We see enough issues in this country to be carried. But why? Because the media has seemingly has no substance of their own. So they come with these little sound bites. This is why the media in this new dispensation is also dying off. Because most of the news is carried on social media and not a direct media. And if they don't bring some substance to the game, I could see why they will die. I could see why the advertising dollars can die. And they should be demanding it because if no business survives, that's where they get the advertising dollars from. But what you have is emasculated media. No one in the media seems to have the, the testicular fortitude or the ovarian audacity to stand up to governance. You are the fourth state, but you're acting like you're the no state. But forget the media. I want to go back. Let's demand at the next sitting of the House that the rules of the House be followed. That way individuals that has competence in the economy, that understands the now and understands the next, can bring forth a coherent message for us as behemoths, bring forth ideas that they can debate and have issues on. We don't need eight hours a day of prepared speeches that somehow, sometime if you listen, you'd think the same person wrote all the speeches. I mean, literally, there's nothing of substantive comes out of the House of Assembly. Our House of Assembly in this time of crisis with 75% of the population at home or jobless or working part-time should be, should be wanting to tune into the House of Assembly to understand the new Bahamas, the new economic model, what is now and what is next. We're not hearing it. We have, we have the Bahamas, we can almost write them off because if they have the steering wheel, an overwhelming majority, and they have the resources to put together the intellectual teams and they cannot bring anything, we can write them off. We have the opposition. We pay them, you know, believe it or not. We pay the Royal, her, her royal her Majesty opposition, a QC, that should have nothing but time on his hand because we pay him to come up with ideas and strategies as an alternative to government. We're not hearing anything from them. Just consider that the Progressive Liberal Party has a house of QCs and lawyers and everything else. They can bring laws to the House of Assembly right now to shift this economy, to do what is necessary for the revitalization of the economy. Bring the laws. Let the FNM vote it down. We will examine the laws. We will look at what you intend to do for the law, what the law intend to do, and recognize that the free national movement is shooting down viable ideas for revitalization of the economy that you brought forward. Just bring it. Table it. It'll be there. It, the platform for which you will come to us shortly and claim that you support, table them right now as laws. And if they lock them down, the laws will still be the idea. When you get into the House of Assembly, you don't have to create no new laws. You could just simply call them right back up and 
table them and move forward. So you don't have to make empty promises to us. Where we want access to capital, bring it right now. Please, we need a new form of our, our, our intellectual capital to go to the House of Assembly. And for those of you like in the DNA and the rest of them who are simply just running around screaming, youth and women, just I want you guys to understand, youth and female is not qualification. 60% of the population is female. If that's a qualification, then 65% is automatically qualified. I know a lady walking downtown right now and lost her head. Just choose female. And guess what also? 70% of the population is young. She is young and she's female. Happen to be strung, strung out on drugs. So, but young and female makes her qualified. That cannot be it. So it isn't a woman. The question we should be asking, are you the woman? But you have to bring by a vision and an idea. For the other political parties, we know how bad governance has been for the last 40 years. How good it will be. Bring your vision, your ideas, and blueprint. Bring it now so that we can actually have the ability to digest it, discuss it, and debate it, and test it. And so, but again, this is back to the House of Assembly because these guys are driving the vehicle at least for the next 18 months or more. We need ideas. We need, we need uh, 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 resolution. On Grand Bahama, this COVID lockdown and anticipated following lockdown could be, it's like, we in a coughing and we hear people nailing it close, nailing it close, nailing it close. The question is, what are we gonna do with humans? I want you to understand, 70% of the jobs that is lost will not be back in its current format. So the question is, what are we gonna to use to replace it? These are the things we wanna hear in the House of Assembly, not prepared speeches. Each one of you, should have some different variation of the new reality that we have that we would like to have flow from you. So put down the speeches and speak exponentially. Speak what you believe. Speak what you know. Speak what you are competent on. Come to the Bahamian people and let's have a conversation of the new Bahamas. Let's use an example. We don't want to hear sound bites where you harvest from the internet what other people say. If you want to talk about the green economy, tell us what it is. Tell us the sectors that come under it. Tell us how behemoths can integrate into it. Because we want your conversation to start in the House of Assembly, but we would like to see it leave the House of Assembly and you continue in the public domain. Not go on talk show and repeat what you already said in the House of Assembly. Sound bites, sound bites, sound bites. We need concrete ideas. If you want to talk about the blue economy, talk about it. Talk about how 10,000, 20,000 behemoths can transition into that, into that blue economy right now. If you want to talk about the orange economy, talk about it. Let's talk about how the broadcast corporation in the Bahamas plays an integral role in it, rather than some prostitute of government carrying government agenda. You know, we watch Zenness. You know what Zenness says today? The prime minister said, the minister of education said, the, 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 the minister of health said, and then they play a piece of what he said, and he also said that they play a piece of it. Are you repeating everything he said? That's not news. We already got that. We want analysis. We want conversation. We want substance coming from our leadership. When you talk about the knowledge economy, show that you know. You know what the knowledge is? Knowledge, show. When you talk about the conceptual economy, don't just scream, the conceptual economy, the conceptual economy. If we adopted the conceptual economy, and no one could explain it, when you start talking about the digital economy, explain, what is the digital economy? What is the difference between the digital economy with the small d and the digital economy with the big D? How does it affect us locally as well as globally? So here it is that we have individuals on radio, television, everywhere, running around screaming, green economy, blue economy, orange economy, knowledge economy, conceptual economy, digital economy. But I guess what? Few if any, has been able to sit down and instructively tell you how you individually or collectively can fit into these economic models. Because these are buzzwords they get off Google and they watch some other speakers speak on it. Just talk about it. In the Bahamas, we need to know not just what to do, we need to know how to do it. We need to be able to highlight those who are capable 
of leading us in doing it. And so what we have to do now, ladies and gentlemen, separate the noise in the marketplace from the price of the fish. And the best way to start is to follow the rules in the House of Assembly and get rid of the reading of speeches. When the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, you, the Prime Minister is coming to you to tell you about a country that he is the navigator of, and somebody's going to give him a sheet of paper days, a couple hours before, for him to read off from you, and that he can't even go back and tell you what they say, what the sheet says. You have to, what I say down here, that, you know, and they, they're looking down to see what they said, because it doesn't come from them. Follow the rules of the house. Let's end the speech reading and let's begin to see that you develop competence in which you speak of. We want to hear about the economy. We want to hear about health care, the health of the nation. We want to hear about what you're going to do about jobs. What are you going to do about ownership? What are you going to do about our resources? What are you going to do uh, uh, about our education of the youth and for re-education of the workforce to embrace the new economic models that we have? These are the things that we want to hear debate well into the night. Not from some prepared speeches because they ran out of things. you got 20 minutes to go on these prepared, prepared speeches. We don't need that. We need men and women to begin to show leadership, competence in leadership, because we are in a crisis. I want you to understand, if you accept that we have a $12 billion economy, $8 billion of our economy has disappeared. And you ask, well, how is that? We See, what happens is we allow them to tell us things. And, and what I mean by that, here's what happens. We say the government is going to start out with a negative $1.3 billion. The question then becomes, where does the government get its $1.3 billion from? Well, if we have a $12 billion economy and the government has a, 12, has a $3 billion budget, that would mean that the government expect to collect 25% average in taxes across the entire economy. So if you start with a $1.3 billion shortage, and that's 25%, which is one quarter of something, all you have to do is times 1.3 times 4. And then you end up with 5.2 billion of an economy that has disappeared. Because they're beginning to tell you, we will not be able to collect from this 5.2 billion of the economy. Okay, what is 5.2 billion of the economy? 1.3 billion dollars that's the shortage they started with so the question then becomes five billion dollars see what is that five billion dollars that five billion dollars is light bill phone bill water bill mortgage rent car payments school fees health insurance payment that's what's disappeared the monies that you would make to make these payments so you how do you sit and, and start focusing about the budget with 1.3 billion dollars of the budget is short without recognizing it is short because $5.3 billion, $5.2 billion of the economy has disappeared. Now, what is happening now is that you're not having people in the House of Assembly talking this message. They're talking about you did something 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and you, like, I don't know what to call it because we are not demanding more. But here's the bigger problem we have. More than $5 billion of the economy is shrinking. Because every month we don't open for July, August, September, October, November, December, we are still short another $140 million. Drop it to even $100 million. That would mean if the economy doesn't open by December, we are another $600 million short. Listen to that carefully now. You're $600 million short in tax revenue. But where does that come from? Times that by four, and you end up with another $2.4 billion in failed income of GDP that hit, the, hit our economy. So now you have $5.2 billion plus $2.4 billion that did not make it into economy. So now you had $7.6 billion out of an anticipated $12 billion. That is to pay mortgages, that's to pay light, food, gas, car, all these things did not make it into our economy in the first six months. The question is, where's the $7.6 billion, $7 billion going to come from? 
we're not hearing strategies on developing uh, micro, medium, small enterprises and businesses. We're not hearing about how do we develop the blue economy, tap into our resources. How do we develop the green economy and get credits and things from around the world? How do we develop the orange economy, our natural talents and abilities? our culture, our heritage, and the new concept of the, of the 21st century. How do, we, how do we capitalize on the, on the digital economy and the conceptual economy and the knowledge economy? You know, just, and, and when you start talking about like the digital economy, you talk about selling stuff that you don't have to people you don't know for money you never had. All of these are revenue imports into the country. But we're not having that conversation. Here we are. Let's go back to February, March. So you have you have March, you have March, April, May, June, July. That what's that? Five months. Five months into a, 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 an economic strategy, and I mean into an economic crisis, and we have not heard any ideas, any plans, even contingent plans for the economy coming from government. We hear a committee that's appointed that's begging you to give them ideas that they were appointed for. What madness is that? We need instructions on how individuals can develop personal economies. See, yes, we have the big load of the $7.6 billion shortage, but we have something better. If we could teach individuals to tap to create what is called personal economies, even if it's just $20,000, $15,000 right now in the time of crisis, utilizing the blue, utilizing the green, utilizing the orange, utilizing the conceptual, the knowledge, and the digital. If we could basically take those six economies, think about it, and put 10,000 individuals in each one of those, and you say, oh, you can't put 10, yes, you can. Let's use, for instance, the, I'm not gonna, like for instance, the, the, the tourism product that we, that we talk about. You know, we have sports tourism, medical tourism, uh, uh, senior tourism, second home ownership, uh, uh, you have so many different sectors in that second home ownership, uh, uh, bed and breakfast, uh, 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 the, in, in, introduce them into the blue economy with sports fishing, deep sea fishing, uh, green for ecotourism. Uh, when you move into an overlap in the tourism and the orange economy, you have the heritage and the cultural and the new things that we develop, junk canoe, uh, uh, carnival if you want to include it, rake and scrape. All of these things is when you begin to segment each of these six economies into smaller sectors, we could very easily see where we could begin to create strategies for what is called personal, personal economic models where individuals or families can look to develop economic models to bring revenue into their houses. We're not having these type of conversation. We're having a conversation about who's the most inept, who's the most incompetent, who's the most incapable, who's the most corrupt, who's the one who hides the most information. Do you know what happens when two political parties argue about who is the most inept? They are actually saying, I'm inept, but you're more inept than me. I am incapable, but you're more incapable than me. I am, I, I, I am more uh, 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 corrupt. I'm corrupt, but you're more corrupt than me. Well, why do we have to start with the basis of being inept, incapable, incompetent, and corrupt? You're trying to tell me that we cannot find 60 among us that is not inept, that is not incompetent, that's not incapable, that's not corrupt, that will go into the House of Assembly where we don't need laws to make them have integrity. We don't need laws to force them to be transparent. We don't need laws to force them to not be corrupt. We, we can't find 60 people who will want to give freedom of information we can't find 60 people who would want to be transparent, that we'd have to f pass laws to force us. What type of cultural indoctrination have we brought ourselves to? There has to be 60 amongst us. But we may have to leave the gangs. Yeah, I say gangs, not political parties, the gangs. Identity politics, where if you don't belong to one of these, you have no identity, you don't eat. Something is wrong. It is beginning to show us right now in the position where we are right now, it has been shown that the political parties are of no use to us. Have you heard any revolutionary ideas coming out of the free national movement? What about the Progressive Liberal Party? What about the DNA? What about the Kingdom Government Movement? What about the Constitutional Party? 
What about the BNCP? What about the BDM that just relaunched? They are soldier crabs. And for those of you who don't know what soldier crabs is, soldier crabs don't have no shell. They're born without shell. What they do is they look for empty, empty things and they clothe themselves in it. And so what is happening now is people are beginning to see a vacuum of leadership. And so you have all the soldier crabs that are coming back out trying to look to fill these positions. But we don't need to use soldier crabs. They are individuals that has competence, that has ability, that can work together as a cohesive team to solve the problems of the Bahamas. But we may have to get rid of our habits, our habits of PLP, FNM, and now DNA. Again, cultures, these are identity politics. They have not gotten us anywhere. They will not get us anywhere. The world has shifted. We were already a decade behind. The world was thrown 10 years into the future. We see technology companies readjusting. So for those of us who are sitting around, who's talking about, oh, when the hotels open up, forget it. For the jobs that you had that supported the hotel and those industries, the jobs, even for you guys and you guys within the civil service, do not believe for one minute you're safe. The civil service salary comes from the taxes or we borrow money to pay you. If we have a $3 billion budget and the government is short $2 billion, civil servants, there is no money to pay you. Let's not pretend. You're not going to have, with all due respect, to the thirty or 40,000 civil service contract, whatever, it's only going to be a matter of time before the other 200,000 people who pay your salary through taxes will turn on you because they're going to be why are we borrowing money to pay people who is doing nothing because there's nothing for you to do because if there's nothing where the government makes money and services have to be rendered you will have nothing to do and technology will then come into place and improve and enhance what it is you're going to do your jobs are not safe don't mind the rhetoric. That's a political talk about taking part of your salary. How is it he going to give you a bond if nobody's there to buy the bond or nobody's there to redeem the bond or, or whatever it is, you, however they want to dress it up? Imagine that every single month you have no income in your house. So you call your Uncle Tom, you, buy, you borrow $500 to pay your bills. You still have no income to pay Uncle Tom back. So you call your Aunt Jane and you borrow $500 to pay her bills the next month. And you have no money to pay Uncle Tom or Uncle Jane back. So what you can do, call Uncle Smith. Hey, Smith, I need to borrow another $500. Do you notice that you're continuously raising debt, but you're having no revenue, no income coming in? How long you think you could go on borrowing every single month to pay bills with zero revenue? Many of you are beginning to realize the reality of that now. We are facing a housing crisis. Mortgages can be foreclosed. Landlords are going to be under pressure. If the landlord doesn't own his house free and clear, how long do you think he can let you stay there while the bank is calling him? And even when he evicts you, guess what? He has nobody there to fill his place because 60, 70% of the population is going to be unemployed. So we have a housing crisis. We have a food crisis. We are facing a crisis of leadership. I want you to realize now, I did not say we are facing a leadership crisis. There's a difference. A crisis of leadership is when the wrong leaders are in place. The incompetent, the incapable, the inept, the corrupt. That's, that's when the crisis of leadership, the wrong leaderships are in place. A crisis of leadership, you can be fixed. A leadership crisis is when there's no leadership in, around to be even to replace those. I believe that we don't have a leadership crisis in the Bahamas. I believe that we have a crisis of leadership. And so all we have to do is look around us at those 40, 50, 60 individuals who are willing to intellectually come together as a hive, a, a hive thinkers, and begin to solve the problem, not as selected groups of family, friends, lovers, finances, and uh, foreigners, 
and fanatical supporters. We don't need that. We in crisis. Right about now, five months into this crisis, we should be amongst us in the free time. We should be debating ideas as to what's now and what's next. Where does it start? Back to the title of this. Follow the rules of the house. Let's have a debate on ideas, a debate of minds. No more reading of speeches. Follow the rules of the house. Reese Chipman, Warren Miller, and uh, Piceville Will Forbes, we're calling on you at the next sitting of the house to ask that the rules of the house be followed. Unless you feel that you're incapable of doing what I just asked. Maybe you need to read your speeches. Maybe you don't possess the knowledge that is necessary to lead us. Follow the rules of the house. That's all we want. Then we could follow the rules of leadership. No more reading speeches, no more praising the prime minister. Every idea in the House of Assembly is the prime minister idea. If every idea in the House of Assembly is the prime minister own, what we got you there for? You in charge of the water? And, and it's this idea that you're following. You're in charge of electricity, and it's his idea. You're in charge of hotels, it's his idea. You're in charge of, of whatever it is, and, it, and it's the prime minister idea. Remember when everything used to be master owned? Every idea you thought of was master idea. Every invention that came up was master owned. Are we still in the slave mentality? We, I know we're still on the plantation, but are we still in the slave mentality that every year we select a king? We elect people to govern for us not to govern over us. Let's abandon the idea that we have nothing to do with governance. Let's begin to demand more from our leadership. So when you go into House of Assembly, Mr. And this is my name for him, Aram Do Nothing Lewis, because I'm now in Central Grand Bahamo. I used to be in East Grand Bahamo. I still consider both of them because I still have Dawson Mill in both locations. I want to hear what you got planned for Central Grand Bahamo. What you got planned for the chemical plants. What are you going to do with the Grand Bahama Port Authority that absolutely serve no purpose and have shown no purpose here? What's going to happen with Grand Bahama? Collectively, for Grand Bahama, Ms. Pakisha Parker, Mr. Aram Dunat Lewis, Mr. Uh, 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 K. Peter Tanquest, Mr. Michael Pintard, and Mr. Frederick Michael Pine, it's time to be talking about what's now and what's next in the House of Assembly. Don't tell me how everybody else is doing. Don't tell me how bad I'm doing. We, we have that conversation. If you know how bad we're doing, tell us the solutions. Grand Bahama, it's been said, is the economic lifeline for the entire Bahamas. If it is, then the five of you are the most important aspect of what's in the House of Assembly. For the three senators we have, Crazy Thompson, uh, uh, Prophetess Darius, uh, uh, Jasmine Darius, and Michael Dowell. When you go to the, I know the, the Senate is nothing more than a group of emasculated men and women, but at least according to the rules, you could bring forth new ideas. Can we hear from you? Can we have some tabling of some documents to fix some of the things that we have, rather than read prepared speeches that some of you could barely read? If you wrote it, you should know what it is. You should be able to speak uh, uh, just off your head, off the cuff. Miss your place, keep talking. You don't have to look down and read. Many of us know what the top of your guy, what the top of your guy's head looks like, more than your face. Many people can't identify you. You know, he's like, meet the guy, say, bend down. I went, oh hey, how you doing? I I know you, because <laughs> I don't recognize your face from looking in the camera in the House of Assembly. We can do better, Bahamas. Let's demand simply they follow the rules of the house. The Bahamas is in crisis. We need economic models to be implemented today, not tomorrow. We have an economic response or recovery committee that's going to report at the end of September. Report going to go to the prime minister, and he and he alone will determine the validity of what they said. Where isn't this where we should be speaking as a collective right now? All of us hashing ideas. Thousands of us were in the ideas, and we're in a digital environment where input could be put in in real time and create a data lake where artificial intelligence could listen to what people say, listen to what they write, listen to their input, and analyze it. Do you know inter artificial intelligence is free at Google, free at Amazon, and the rest of them? 
in creating data lakes and building data warehouses and whatever else and asking questions and whatever else. It's all available for free. But we, we, we're struggling with paperless documents across all of our ministries. The world isn't, but we as a country are. So I'm saying to you, let's not Let's, let's have the real conversation with the green economy, the blue economy, the orange economy, the digital economy, the conceptual economy, the knowledge economy, and whatever else economy, economic model they want to have. Not just talk. Blueprints, this is how it works, this is how you could get involved, and everything else. That, that should be it. But let's, let it all begin with following the rules of the house, the house rules. And that is speak from your knowledge base not from some speech, your PS, or some family, friend, lover, whoever just prepared it for you, to the PLP, to the FNM, bring laws. For you backbenchers, just, you don't have to write the law, but clearly, if you understand what you want done, get up in the House of Assembly and explain it. It becomes the million dollar organization we call the Office of the Attorney General to convert that into, into, the, into the rules, into the laws we want passed. You don't have to write the laws. You can at least explain to them, this is what I think should be done. And then you look over to whoever and says, I charge you to tell the Attorney General to get busy on passing this law. But that's no excuse for the office of the uh, Majesty or official opposition. You have the ability, you have the resources that has been given to you at, in the office of Her Majesty opposition to acquire whatever. You have had decades in governance. And you say you can do all these things. You have a house full of QCs and lawyers and things that has benefited from the la guess of your governance. It's time for them to give back to your party. Let them craft the laws and whatever else that we need. For the DNA and all your other parties, if you don't have a vision bold enough to attract individuals with the ability to help you craft laws and policies, you don't stand a chance in this new Bahamas. It can't be just be vote for us because we ain't had a chance to screw you over yet. We're going to focus forward. We're going to build forward. And so I'm asking you guys to call your member of parliament and tell them, please follow the rules of the House that we can begin to have debates of ideas. We demand from the PLP to bring forth policy ideas and, and discuss those in the House of Assembly. Don't discuss what the FNM did or didn't do or they ain't going to do. Pretend that they ain't there because we are we get into the realize that they might not actually be there. So you get a chance. You use whatever time they give you to talk. You know what's amazing to PLP and you third parties? You're in the age of information technology. You don't need to wait on ZNS, Our News, Eyewitness News, uh, JCN, uh, uh, whoever else there is. You could talk to us directly. But we don't want to hear you sit and talk for hours on bullshit about what the FNM did. We know how you screwed us over. If, we, if that's all we want to expect from you, then you disqualify. We may have to just go, like you say, with a, with a ban of independence. That may be our only hope. At least we'll have enough people to say no and yay. You know, even if a political party wins based on the Constitution, we'll have enough to vote it down or to change whatever rules or to modify whatever you bring. So maybe we need 10, 15 independents in the House of Assembly. Maybe one day they'll come together and call in, so whatever, come together and, what is it? Uh, 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 come to, anyway, come together and form themselves into the political party and move the country forward until we can change the constitution or give political parties the power. So when we start talking about change of new governance and education of people in the constitution so they can stop screaming for what it is. You know, when you start talking about immigration, we fix immigration policy now with technologies and laws. We don't need to wait for you to come and bullshit us for five years because once you get into the driver's seat, then you'll pretend Bring the laws right now for immigration reform. Bring it right now. And please, for all of you QCs in the PLPs and in the FNM, stop bullshitting us about saying you need to change the Constitution to address number seven in there. Number seven is the blueprint, and it gives you permission to create any laws that doesn't conflict with that. So you know what? So yes, you can be, just for you guys who are listening, you could be born in the Bahamas to non behemoth parents, but do you know the Constitution gives them the right to put additional requirement, such as legal entry, such as residency in the Bahamas. All of these things can be put in law, in the immigration law, to substantiate number seven. But they have you all talking, and all you goddamn experts who have no understanding, the Constitution, the Constitution say that! You, because of you, 
we can't have a sensible conversation. The Constitution is the blueprint. The Constitution prohibits, restricts, or give consent to, and uh, uh, protects. Everything in the Constitution protects. It also gives two times consent. It gives two times for consent to discrimination. It didn't say you have to discriminate, and that's gaming and marriage. Our Constitution have really no prohibition. So we could put whatever we want in law. When a person land here, the person would say, you must be, a, your parents born here, but you must be a legal residence. And we could fix that. I'm gonna have another video on how we could have border control. Because all we have to do is fix the law for coming in. We could fix the law. You know, I have people running on, they run on all the time about, oh, we have, we have, we have immigrants here with, with work visas and everything. Guess what? Just change the law that simply says anybody with a work visa also show a legitimate lease because apparently if you own a house a mortgage or something or a lease show us a lease to attach to your uh, 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 your visa your work visa easy simple if you have children show us where they're registered in school and and it says that we must guarantee education it didn't say we have to be provide free education these are things that we can't discuss because we got too many Google experts. We got people, too many people talking about what they believe, what they feel, what they how, and everything. Why? Because we allow our leadership to read speeches and we're not getting any concrete information. We all talk about, I feel, I believe, I hope, I pray, I wish, dream, garbage. Yes, we must have faith. But the Bible says faith without works is dead. And what is that other faith? That means that faith, F-A-I-T-H, without taking possession of your F-A-T-E, ain't word crap. And faith, F-A-T-E, is an action word. And so, work to work. Can you imagine a guy sitting for four years that he will win the lottery and never buying a, not ever buying a ticket? But our religious leaders will have you believe that you just need to believe. Just believe. And pay them. Don't forget. Sow a seed and pay them. Because we allow ourselves to be distracted from what reality is. And I'm saying to you people, please join me in demanding that the rules of the house. And Alton Moultrie, any one of you who have access to Alton Moultrie, share this with him. You know, what I have is I have a tendency of political leaders... When they're in government, they block me. Yeah, I, half of the PLPs from the last administration still have me blocked because they don't know how to do it. They have, whoever's handling their page block me and all the new FNMs, they all have me blocked. Not because of attacking them. The truth is painful, very painful. Recognizing your failures is painful. And then they keep me blocked because when they leave, I'm gonna remind them that you were there for five years and didn't do shit. And guess what? Now you're out of office and you still don't know crap. Because the arrogance of paralysis of analysis, when you didn't recognize that the collective intelligence of all of us is superior to one of you. So ladies and gentlemen, I say, please, call your members of parliament, join me in demanding, post on face page, Facebook page across, follow the rules of the house. No more reading speeches. Speak exponentially, I think it's called. Say what you believe. Say what you know. Speak when you have something to say, not just to say something. Thank you guys for joining me with a little bit of my rambling on, beyond following the rules of the house. And I hope I get better in my conversations. I'm just so full of information and so full of anger, not towards anyone, just anger at the opportunities that is available to us that we're not taking because we choose political parties over self, self-preservation. I'm hoping that this COVID crisis causes us to recognize that your loyalty to political parties is not going to pay your rent. It's not going to pay for your car. It's not going to pay your mortgage. It's not going to pay for your school fee. It's not going to put food on your table. It's not going to do anything for you. And now you'll begin to recognize that political parties, gangs, identity politics is of no value to you then you'll begin to become selfish that's where you get to put God family and country and eliminate parties and we can build a better Bahamas
as the collective intelligence of all of us. I thank you, and for those of you, I ask you to share the video, share the video, share the video. Uh, if you want to, please go to allencjohnson.com and all of my social media pages. I'm hoping by the end of the month, I begin to post across all of them because I'm gonna not only just be critiquing government as we have it, but I'm gonna begin to talk about the ideas and concept. I've had 20 years being the blue economy and the green and the orange economy, the knowledge economy, the conceptual economy and digital economy, but actually living in those environment and helping create some of the very mechanisms that we're gonna be using for it. So I ask you to watch this again, and I invite you to inbox me and WhatsApp me, 443-7189. And if you want me to, write, to talk very specifically about something about those economic models and how we could move into it, because I could tell you, nobody gonna call me. They're not, because I don't know nothing according to them. But they should actually debate me on that. You know, in 15 years, I've never had a call from any economic committee or anybody thing the government have. You know, you'll have an MP call. They just wanted just enough information so they could say something, not to understand where they could execute. You have people on committees who send you some private message. Can you tell me what to say? <laughs> not, I don't want to understand. Just tell me just enough to put down so I can have something to contribute on it. And I invite you to please share the video and ask some questions directly or indirectly. All of my uh, contacts, including uh, my WhatsApp business and otherwise, if you go to allencjohnson.com, it'll come up, you just click it, it'll take you to wherever, wherever there is. And as I get my new equipment and other things, I begin to have some conversation more directed because many of us is gonna need an urgent need or some personal economies. And one of the things I will be able to do is tell you in more details the things that you have to agitate for. So access to international capital, because uh, that's very important for rebuilding the economy. Because the banks and everything else, what they, what they give us is called pimp prostitute arrangements. You know, 8%, 9% for mortgages for houses, 20, 30, 40, 30% for, for, for credit cards and other loans and stuff. It's outrageous. You could have free money on the on, in the on the global marketplace, and we not and many of you don't need no million dollars. You need ten thousand, twenty thousand, hundred thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars to fund your idea, and being able to refine and define those ideas will give you access to capital, and understand intellectual capital is more valuable than cash. Money and money don't make money. It's only when money goes with an idea, money become multiply, and once you could refine that, you can have it done. We could talk about the change. Believe it or not, I have another video that's going to be coming up, more so for Grand Bahama. I'm going to explain to you how we're going to redefine the Grand Bahama economy. For many of you who don't own a home or facing foreclosure or anything else, I'm going to show you. you I know you think this is fantasy. In the new global environment, for where you are geolocated, you can own a three or four bedroom house absolutely without mortgage. In fact, Many of you on, uh, on, on New Providence and the other island, you can build a house on Grand Bahama and do not live in the house and make, a new, make enough money from that house to pay the mortgage on that house and to pay your rent or mortgage in Nassau or New Providence as it's called, we call it Nassau, Freeport we say, but it means Grand Bahama. And so we're gonna talk about these blueprints. How is it that I can build a house on Grand Bahama and use a strategy that the bank and the 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 officer prime minister can uh, can can do that will actually take you and being able to own do not live in it and have that house pay for itself and pay a hundred percent of your rent on New Providence in the new economy. Yes, why is it we can't build 25,000 homes on Grand Bahama where behemoths get to be empowered in the new redefined digital economy? If we're gonna rebuild the economy, let's rebuild it for behemoths. Almost everything you know is so much easier when you think digitally. You know how you say digital makes everything easy? But when you try to convert an analog thought into digital is where you have problems. I'm gonna, being a person that not talk about the future, 
I talk from the future. I live here. I live in the future. I talk from the future. I don't talk about the future. And I want to be able to explain to each of us how we could literally, do you know, I know I'm running on again, do you know a, a reasonable economic development plan with the elimination of the Grand Bahama Port Authority because they serve no problem can retire the national Bahamas in less than 10 years. Yes. And put 25, 30, 40, as much as 60,000 head of households. I didn't say jobs. I'm talking about one person in each home. 50,000 of you in charge of your own destiny. Right here in Grand Bahama. Everything that is needed is here. And the new post-COVID reality makes that so much easier. Right here in Grand Bahama. We could have, Grand Bahama is the only island today that has all the necessary infrastructure, airport, harbor, digital infrastructure, electricity, water, everything. No, we don't have no water yet, but we could build it. That could, that could revolutionize the Bahamas, right? Right, almost instantaneously, and build the jobs. In fact, when we begin to think about what is called resiliency, you know, we, we often, I hear them using the word resilient and resiliency. Those are two different things. And so we, we need to build a, both a resilient and resiliency into governance. Because if a hurricane was to hit the Bahamas, more so New Providence, and we don't have a strategy, we will be wiped out. Because we have no government to replace it. We should have a digital government infrastructure right now where literally, like how you see the, prime, the president is in the plane, our prime minister can run government from any island in this country. We're small enough to do it. But we don't have that. We have Aram Do Nothing Lewis in charge of rethinking and redesigning the Bahamas, you know. That whole disaster recovery and resiliency and all them other things, in charge of Neem and all these other things, that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to strategize and, and, and come up with ideas for that, you know, but it ain't gonna happen. We need to, we, Aram ain't gonna do nothing. He ain't do nothing. If he ain't do nothing in, in Central Grand Bahama, you really think you can do something in the rest of the country? But technically, you know, I thank Michael Pintard for his Jesus effort. What would Jesus do? Fish and bread. Feed the people. But we need to become fishermen. And I ask you, please, thank you, share the video. And hopefully, again, as we get to talk, I'll become more succinct. But there is a new opportunity. There's a new Bahamas ahead for all of us. And all we have to do is understand the pathway and have individuals define the vision for a new Bahamas. I've always had one for a new Bahamas. But it doesn't have to be mine exclusively. Vision is never necessarily one person. You could have a collective vision for a country. It should never be built on one person. What if you build a country on my vision and I have a heart attack tomorrow? Then what happens? I'll try my best to define whatever I can to develop it and, and plant the seeds for growth and greatness in all of us and we can recover. And best of all, share the video, share the video, share the video. And guess we're gonna laugh. My next video tomorrow, maybe two o'clock, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna show you tomorrow, two o'clock, guess what I'm gonna do? Share the video, like the page. I'm gonna talk about Sovereign Wealth Fund and how the most honorable Hubert Alexandra Minnis can solve our national debt and begin the transformation of our economic picture in one decision, just one. And it involves the sovereign wealth fund. And I talk about the resource. He can do it and end the corruption that sits in the office of the prime minister and the prostitution of bohemians. Tune in tomorrow, two o'clock. Thank you so much. Love you, Bahamas. Love you, Grand Bahama. Because you know why? We're going to be the heart of the new economy for the Bahamas. A whole group. We're going to become that Silicon paradise. We're going to become the digital communities, the digital cities, the digital island that make up the digital Bahamas. That's my dream. That's my ambition. That's my passion. And I've never seen a better time than now because all of the C blockers who for 15 years or more that is made sure that I haven't had time to express myself and now showing themselves to be inept, incapable, 
and corrupt and whatever else you want because they will not be able to bring you the answers. They can't. If crazy know what to do, he would have done it by now. If anyone, you, you really believe that in the last five, six months specifically, uh, five MPs and three uh, 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 three senators, used to be four, because uh, Katie Forbes Smith used to be a senator. She's still a senator, but she used to sit in the house. So you think if they knew that they wouldn't have told you? And if they do, you have to ask, well, why haven't they in three years? They don't know. We know for over two decades, the Grand Bahama Port Authority has not done a single thing on this island. They have not brought a single investment to this island in two decades. So what are they here for? Ask yourself that. For those of us who live in Grand Bahama, for the rest of the Bahamas, why are you giving them hundreds of millions a year in tax breaks if they serve no purpose? The grand deception. We'll talk about that too. But see you tomorrow at 2 o'clock. And we'll talk about what can we do to move towards development of a sovereign wealth fund which will solve it almost instantaneously another day about how Grand Bahama, the savior of the Bahamas can be executed with the green economy the blue economy, the orange economy the knowledge economy, the conceptual economy, the digital economy not people who talk about it but people that have the competence to talk to it. Thank you Bahamas love you, alancjohnson.com share the video Send your questions, send your ideas. Let's begin a conversation about the new Bahamas. Thank you again.